In this video, we're going to talk about impulse. So this is Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. And of course, we know that acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So if I plug that in for acceleration here, I get mass times a change in velocity over time. Now, mass times change in velocity, that's just a change in momentum. So what this tells us is that force is equal to change in momentum over time. And what this equation tells us is that a change in momentum is caused by a force. And that makes sense, right? Because we know that in order for momentum to change, velocity has to change. And we know that a change in velocity is an acceleration and accelerations are caused by forces. So this equation is a really important one for this video lesson itself. Now, of course, we can have an incremental change over time. So we also have that the net force is equal to dp over dt. Um, and this equation says that the net external force on a particle changes the particle's linear momentum, p. Now, if there's no net external force, momentum can't change because that means there's no acceleration, therefore no change in velocity. If we have an equation for momentum with respect to time, the force in this case will be the derivative of the equation because we know a force is equal to dp over dt. Also, if we have a graph of momentum as it changes with time, the force will be the slope of the graph. And of course, we can get that from this equation because we know that slope is rise over run. Here, the slope or the rise over run is the change in momentum over change in time. So change in momentum will be on the y-axis, change in time will be on the x-axis. And therefore, if we have that type of graph, then the slope will be the force. By rearranging this equation, um, and what I mean by that is we are just going to multiply both sides of the equation by dt, um, what we end up getting here is that our change in momentum dp is equal to the force with respect to time dt. So we can find the net change in the ball's momentum due to the collision if we integrate both sides of this equation with respect to t time t. Uh, so from a time t initial to just before before, which is just before the collision to a time t final just after the collision. So here we are integrating both sides of this equation with respect to time. So here's the same equation here and that left side of the equation just simply becomes the change in momentum and then the right side which is a measure of both the magnitude and the duration of the force we call this impulse. So this is force as it changes with time and if we don't have a variable force um, it'll just be the magnitude of the force F times the time T, and I'll talk more about that later. But if our force varies with time, then we take the integral of that equation with respect to time in order to get our impulse, which is J. The change in an object's momentum is equal to the impulse on the object. So that's the definition of impulse, is just a change in momentum. So impulse is what causes a change in momentum, and impulse is force times time. Or again, if you have a variable force, it is the integral of force with respect to time. So we get this equation here, the change in momentum is equal to impulse. Now this can be written in vector form because we know that both momentum and impulse itself is also a vector and it can also be written in component form. So this is just an example in the x direction. So change in the momentum in the x direction is equal to impulse in the x direction and then you also get that change in momentum in the x direction is equal to the integral of force in the x direction with respect to time. So like I said, impulse changes momentum. So the definition of impulse is a force F applied during a time T. So the change in momentum depends on both the force that acts on the object and the length of time that it acts. So what this tells us is that a force sustained for a long time is going to produce more change in momentum than does simply the same force applied briefly. So, and this makes sense, right? Because if you're pushing something Thing. If you just push it really fast and then stop, so for a very short period of time, you're not going to change the momentum much. But if you push it for a longer period of time, then you will change the momentum more. So the longer the time, the greater the force, the greater the change in momentum. So both force and time are important in changing an object's momentum. 
So like I said, impulse J is equal to the force times the time interval. So here it is in variable form, J is equal to force times T. And so in order to have a greater impulse exerted on something, you have to have a greater force, a greater time, and therefore the greater the change in momentum will be because we know that impulse is a change in momentum. So what we get in variable form for this is J impulse equals change in momentum. And then of course we can just plug in what we know about impulse and change in momentum. Impulse is force times time. Change in momentum is just delta MV. And of course usually it's a change in velocity. So you can rewrite this as force times time is equal to M delta V. And this is a very important equation. Now, for some conceptual stuff, so if we want to increase momentum as much as possible, we want the greatest force possible and the longest time possible because, of course, a change in momentum is equal to an impulse, which is force times time. Now, this is the reason that um, people follow through. So in sports, a golfer is going to follow through on their swing because it increases the amount of time that the golf club is is in contact with the golf ball. Same thing for a baseball player. The baseball player follows through with the bat when he swings because, again, that follow through increases the amount of time that the bat is in contact with the ball. When the baseball player just like, what's it called, bunting, right? When they don't follow through and they just kind of put the bat right there and the ball hits the bat, it doesn't go very far, right? It doesn't have much of a change in momentum because the time is not elongated like it is when the baseball player follows follows through with their swing. Now, if we're going to decrease momentum, so the previous slide was increasing momentum and we're trying to increase the momentum as much as possible, but instead, let's say we're trying to decrease momentum. So say you're stuck in a car that's out of control and you have to choose between hitting a haystack or hitting a concrete wall. Now, which would you choose? Well, hopefully you said you would choose the haystack because it's going to be a little bit safer, right? So the change in momentum we know is equal to our impulse. Now, of course, impulse is equal to force times time. In this case, whether you hit the haystack or the concrete wall, your change in momentum is going to be the same because you have an initial velocity that the car is going, say, 30 meters per second, which is very fast, by the way. So say the car is going 30 meters per second. It has a certain mass, right? And then we're going to go to a stop. So the final velocity is zero. So in both of these cases, you have the same change in momentum. So you have the same impulse. However, if you change the impact time, you can change the impact force, okay? Now, if we increase the impact time, then we can decrease the impact force, right? So if the change in momentum occurs over a longer period of time, the force of impact becomes smaller, okay? So like I said, our change in momentum itself is not changing and therefore impulse is not changing. But remember, impulse is force times time. So if we elongate the time, the force has to decrease, okay? Because the impulse stays the same. So if the change in momentum, momentum occurs over a shorter period of time, so say if you hit the concrete wall instead of the haystack, then therefore, again, same impulse, but now the time is shorter, so the force is bigger, and that is why the concrete wall will be more dangerous than, say, hitting the haystack, because your time is shorter, and therefore force is bigger. Now, when you're hitting, like I said, either the wall or the haystack, um, and you're coming to a stop, the momentum is decreased by the same impulse because the change in momentum is the same. The impulse, the same impulse does not mean the same amount of force or the same amount of time. And this is really important, okay? So impulse is force times time. So if we change one of those things, the other has to change in the opposite direction because impulse has to stay the same. So this is the same product of force times time. So in order to keep the force small, we have to extend the time. Now this is the reason that airbags can save your life in a car crash because the airbag will elongate the time that your body is coming to a stop. If you just hit the dashboard, 
that time is shortened and therefore the force is larger. And also why if you drop, say, a glass cup on the carpet, it's less likely to break than if you drop it on just your kitchen floor, unless you have carpet in your kitchen, which would be kind of weird. Um, but on just your kitchen floor, right, it's not carpeted. Um, people say it has less give. All right, you've probably heard that word before, give. So give is gonna slow that glass down over a longer period of time, which is what the carpet does, and therefore the force is smaller, and therefore the glass hopefully doesn't break. Now, if we have a function for force with respect to time, we can evaluate our impulse J and thus our change in momentum delta P by integrating that function. Um, so if we plot that force versus time, we can evaluate J by finding the area under the curve. So this is the, the relationship between all these variables, right? We have force, our impulse, we have our time, we have our change in momentum. So here, if we have a um, equation for force with respect to time, so we have force on our y-axis, time on our x-axis here, and we plot that, we know, of course, that change in momentum is equal to impulse is equal to force times time. So since it's force times time, this is going to be the area under the curve. Or, you know, change in momentum, J is equal to the integral of force with respect to time. Now, if we don't know how a force varies with time, but we do know the average force, we can use the equation just J impulse is equal to average force times delta T or that time interval T. Um, now, sometimes this is a little bit easier to find your area under the curve. So if a certain problem, and I think I have an example here, that um, if there's a problem that gives you a force curve with respect to time, so force plotted with respect to time, and you're able to find the area under the curve and they ask you for change in momentum or ask you for impulse, all you have to do is just calculate that area under the curve. Of course, sometimes they just give you the function and it's a little bit harder to find the area under the curve. And in that case, you would have to integrate whatever function you're given.